Welcome to our Alumni Nutrition Talks series, a celebration of 40 years of training nutritional therapists. I'm Heather Rosa, the Dean, and I hope you enjoy this presentation. Hello and welcome to my talk all about how to get your children to eat healthier food. My name is Catherine Jeans. I'm a proud graduate of ION and I'm also the director of the Family Nutrition Expert Clinic. You can read more about my work in the information below. Today we're going to cover lots of practical tips on how to get your children to eat more healthy food from younger children right through to teenagers. We hear so much about what children shouldn't be eating. There's a lot of talk about ultra processed foods, UPFs right now. And it's really important to try to, to, try to reduce our family's intake of these. But how can we do that? And how can we actually get our young people to be including more of the healthier, more nourishing foods on their plates when there's so many UPFs around. So we'll cover some of these challenges that you can face when it comes to healthy eating and how to overcome those barriers. We'll look at what is a balanced approach and key foods to support healthy growth and development. We'll look at some of the most common nutritional deficiencies, what might be missing, things like omega-3 fats and other key vitamins and minerals to support balanced behavior, mood, learning, sleep, and growth. And we'll think about tips to help motivate children to want to eat more healthily. Most of all, I want to give you a realistic and practical approach. This is a non-judgmental approach. And every little incremental step that you can take to improve your children's nutrition is absolutely worth of it. So let's have a little think about the challenges and the barriers that we face. As a mum of two and having worked with hundreds and hundreds of uh, families in my clinic, I know that it can be challenging to get our young people to eat healthy food, particularly when they get to an age when they can make those choices themselves. I get it. And the biggest tip that I have is not to strive for per perfection, but really to work on the things that you can add into their diet. Rather than focusing on what they shouldn't be eating, let's try to really fill them up on the good stuff. So wherever you're at with your family's healthy eating, wherever their food intake and nutrition intake is, is at, you know, on a scale, if you like, this is the best it should be. And perhaps this is not so great. Even just stepping to here is worth doing and it will make a, 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 you know, a change and a positive impact on your child's healthy growth and development. I think fundamentally, what I would say as grown-ups and carers is to try to model healthy eating yourself. It will not only make you more resilient and healthy yourself as a parent or carer, but it will also model a healthy way of eating for the young people that you are around. So really think about how you talk about food do you say things like, oh, I'm on a diet or, you know, talk about your weight in a negative way? Like, do you talk about good and bad foods? I'm being good. I'm being naughty. Just think about that balance and perhaps sometimes show yourself eating something not so healthy without comment and the balance of that and really enjoying it without guilt and then moving on and most of the time trying to embrace healthy eating. You know, with young people, sometimes we just have to let go every now and again. We cannot control everything that our children do. And so particularly this is the case as they get older and spend more time outside of the house and around other children. The fact is that many, many children do not eat a healthy diet. And that obviously can be problematic when we are trying to encourage our young people to eat more healthy food. 
So most of us know that children in the UK are eating too much ultra processed food. It's been a lot in the headlines. So that's not enough fiber, vegetables, fruits, uh, healthy fats and other key nutrients. In fact, the UK diet is made up on average of over 60% ultra processed food. It's one of the highest percentages in the world. And it's a huge problem, but it's really important not to cast to blame. There are so many reasons why our families can end up eating more ultra processed food and that might include a lack of cooking skills, economic reasons might be time poor, lack of knowledge, high levels of stress, unstable home life um, and difficulty changing children's eating habits and there may be many sensory issues involved. You know, eating beige foods that taste the same can feel safe for some children, particularly where there is neurodiversity. And the, react, the reality is that ultra processed foods are everywhere. That is the reality. And that starts from a young age. Nearly a third of all baby and toddler foods in the UK are ultra processed. So children from a very young age are getting used to very easy to eat, bland, quite sweet foods. And ultra processed foods can be really highly addictive. They are less complex, they are soft, they are sweet, and they make children often feel safe. And they're easy to shovel in so that children can go out and play. Even if you're doing your best to provide healthy food for your children, it also can be really difficult when they compare what they're eating to children around them. And that particularly can become more problematic as they get older. We need to try to make healthy eating not a battle. But what I would really recommend that it is worth trying to make consistent changes, but to be consistent with it. You know, we really do need to think about this because recent research published in the BMJ has linked ultra processed foods to over 32 different harmful effects to our health, including cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and even the risk of some forms of cancer. Urgent action is needed. So what can we do? That doesn't mean that we should never, ever eat ultra processed foods. But what we can do is work on reducing the amount of it we have in our family's diets. In my clinic, though, I see so many parents and carers who know about the dangers of ultra processed foods, who are worried about them, but they just don't know where to start to make change to their child's diet. And sometimes I find that families don't even realize that they're eating unhealthy ingredients. I'll give you an example, a parent that I saw just recently who brought me lots of food packages and said, look, I'm feeding my child something really healthy because on the front it says various health claims like a great source of calcium. But when you turn that packet over, sometimes we don't realize just how many ultra processed ingredients there are in that food. For many parents and carers, I, I get it. It can feel huge to make family dietary change. There's so much as parents that we have to take, uh, that we have to think about on a day-to-day -day basis. But I really encourage you not to take an all or nothing approach to nutrition. Any small change, positive small change you can take is absolutely worth it. So try not to take that all or nothing thinking and don't give up. We do not live in an ideal world. There's are lots of other challenges that parents are facing and sometimes good enough is good enough. It can be tough cooking from scratch every single day. So I really encourage you to focus on what can you achieve? Now you're obviously here and listening to me talk because you want to make change, but that doesn't mean that you have to go from one extreme to another, taking all your young person's favorite foods away. I really recommend you don't do that because you'll have a revolution on your hands. With children, it can be much better to start with one or two things at a time and gradually, but consistently make change and focus on healthy, nutritious ingredients to include. 
What can we put on the plate? Every time you think about making a meal, just think, what is one more thing or two more things that I could put on this plate just to make it that little bit more nutritious? And for me, this is the key concept to get children to eat healthily, to encourage them to add more nutritious ingredients that might support their brain health, make them feel stronger, more energetic, more balanced sleeping patterns, and you can really relate some of the foods that you include to those positive health benefits for children. Try not to label food as healthy or unhealthy, good or bad, but just think about perhaps what tasty food you could add to make that plate more nutritious. Children do respond really well to to being given choice. Yeah, so try to offer them choice within the healthy range. For example, would you like an orange or would you like an apple for dessert? Or take them food shopping or to a farmer's market and get them excited about new things. What would they like to try? Could they try a new fruit that they haven't tried before? Get them looking through recipe books with you and give them choice of things to cook. If you do have a more picky or restrictive eater, it's a really good idea to encourage them to be around food, even if they don't want to try new things, actually getting them touching, smelling, and just cooking new foods can help to just desensitize them gradually over time. It is good to try to cook more things from scratch and to introduce more homemade food, Um, but it might be that you start cooking healthier versions of their favorite foods. For example, you could do something like chicken breast dipped in breadcrumbs, um, wholemeal breadcrumbs if possible and uh, if possible and grilled, or you could do the same with uh, fish or something like that. So you're making really gradual changes. If they like chips, you could start making homemade wedges, keep those skins on for added fiber or a jacket potato or something like that. You could start batch cooking meals. So you've got some of their favorite things, which you're then cooking once, but eating twice. You might, you know, just get a bit creative. Perhaps have, we have in our house, breakfast tea, we call it, which is, you know, a cooked breakfast effectively, but done as healthily as I can. So it might be some eggs, good quality sausages, bacon, and then always some fruit and veg on that plate and some wholemeal toast or pita chopped up. I have seen this approach work really well for quite restrictive eaters and even those with sensory needs. But if you do have a child with sensory needs, it may be advisable to get some professional advice to help you make some change. Um, I had a teenage boy that uh, I was working with a few years ago, very restrictive eater, and he was only eating about three foods. And we just really, really slowly over weeks and weeks and weeks started to introduce a breaded chicken onto a plate near his plate and that was there and then it went onto his plate and then he tried it and then we went for a salmon, breaded piece of salmon and then that went onto the plate and very slowly over time we managed to uh, uh, gradually increase the variety in his diet. The fact is that any homemade food is going to be better than an ultra processed version. Even if it's cake or chips, if you make it yourself, it is going to be healthier because it will have less ultra processed ingredients. Here's an example for you. If you pick up a bag of oven chips, for example, from the frozen section, what are chips made from? Potatoes, right? It should just be potatoes. There might be some... um, oil or something that goes with it. But you look at some frozen oven chips, there are so many different ingredients in some of them. But, you know, it really does vary between brands. So do get label savvy. And I really do encourage you to get your children into the kitchen, teach them about real food by getting them hands on. And perhaps you might, as they get a bit older, allocate them a weekly or fortnightly meal to cook. So what is it that children do actually need to eat? We've talked about what we need to be wary of and how to get a bit more of the good stuff in, but how do we know? What, do we, what is it they actually need to have on their plate? Well, I think key is getting as much balance, 
but variety and fresh food as we possibly can. There is no perfect diet, let me just say that to you. But good nutrition is vital for a developing immune system, a healthy heart to support bone density, to support brain power, and also to support our mood, our sleep, and balanced behavior, and so many other factors in our body. We often associate good food with physical health, our bones, our muscles, our skin, for example. And obviously this is really important, but the way that we eat also is very much linked to our mental health and behavior as well. A study a few years ago in Norfolk with over 9,000 children found that those who eat their five a day had much better mental health scores. And there are many research studies which do link good nutritious food and particular nutrients with our brains, behavior, and mood. So one of the places I get parents and carers to start is by trying to add a rainbow to their child's plate. So increasing the intake of vegetables and fruit. And this can really help to set children up for a lifetime of good health. I often see, and I know this in my own family as well, uh, you know, we get a bit stuck in a rut, don't we, with the kind of vegetables and fruit that we choose. And it's a really nice idea to be thinking about the colors of the rainbow. And you can even use my rainbow chart to help you as a family work together to include more colors. And all those colors that you see in vegetables and fruit really are important for our brain health and they help to feed a healthy gut microbiome, which not only supports that gut brain axis, but has so many other important roles throughout the body from our immunity to a healthy digestion. So one thing I would say is make it so normal to have vegetables and or fruit with every single meal. You might put it on a separate plate and put it in the middle of the table, or you could think about giving vegetables as a starter, like a salad or some chopped up vegetables as a starter, or you could give your children a smoothie when they get home from school, a homemade smoothie, or you could just give them a little plate of chopped up vegetables and fruit, put it beside them while they're doing their homework or even watching telly. Often you find children eat things, uh, you know, and, and just don't kind of make a fuss of it. Just allow it to happen. Yeah. Um, our eating behavior really does develop, develop in those first few years of life. And it really is important to try to challenge young taste buds as early as you can. If you challenge children with different flavors and also different visual aspects of foods and different textures, not just brown, sweet, soft, and, and you know, easy to eat. Um, you know, that can really help them uh, set them up for a lifetime of healthier eating. And what I would recommend is just try to always get that color on the plate, that healthy, lovely rainbow. So even if it is a ready cooked meal or even a takeaway, could you add some extra salad or just microwave a few frozen vegetables or have some salad as a starter or a dessert for fruit uh, of fruit? And that's a really important concept, you know, trying not to make an all or nothing approach to it. One more vegetable or fruit really is worth it. So here's some tips on getting children to eat more veg and fruit. So we've already talked about the rainbow challenge, yeah, trying to encourage your children to eat more colors of the rainbow. And I've got a rainbow chart you can use. There's lots that you can find online where you all just tick off if you're eating every color of the rainbow every day. That works with your younger children really nicely. And I encourage you to leave some veg or some fruit in their eye line, either that's in the fridge or on the worktop, because children do eat with their eyes. And so if they're hungry, they will gravitate towards that. Take them to the supermarket and allow them to pick something new to try from the veg and fruit aisle. Take them to pick your own type places. Go to farm shops where there's such a beautiful array of vegetables and fruit. You can make frozen yogurt bark with berries. So just spread some yogurt out on a baking tray lined with baking paper and sprinkle over some berries and freeze that and then break that. Or you could whiz up some fruit and yogurt and make some lollies. You could make some nice smoothies, which are lovely in the summer. And you can hide lots of vegetables and fruit in different things. So you can use a grater. I tend to use a lemon zester and I will hide 
carrots, courgettes, and things like that into things like bolognese. You can put cauliflower into mash. You can even cook lots of little bits of vegetables and uh, you know make put them in ice cubes uh, that you could then easily add in. You can make sauces for pasta with lots and lots of different vegetables just by roasting lots of carrots, courgettes, tomatoes, aubergines, that kind of thing, and blitzing that all together to make a lovely sauce, which you could freeze in batches as well. You've got lots and lots of hidden uh, vegetables in there. You can freeze fruit, which is really nice. Uh, frozen blueberries, frozen bits of banana, frozen grapes are really, really nice. You can even get a banana, shove a lollipop stick in it, pop it in the freezer and you've got instant banana ice cream. Perhaps you could drizzle a little bit of dark chocolate on there and things like berries dipped into dark chocolate are also really, really delicious. So let's move on to healthy fats. And this is another area of potential deficiency that I see so often in my clinic. Children generally are not eating enough healthy fat, particularly those omega-3 fatty acids, which are so important for healthy brain development, uh, but also so many areas of our physical health as well. So children should be aiming to eat oily fish a couple of times a week. So that's things like salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardine, herring, uh, because these are really high in omega-3 fatty acids. And if they don't eat oily fish, children should be consuming some nuts and seeds on a regular, if not daily basis, and particularly good ones are chia seeds and linseeds or flax seeds, which are the seeds which are highest in omega-3 fatty acids. Our brain is made from 60% fat and DHA, which is one of those omega-3 fats, makes up about 10 to 15% of this. There's many research studies looking at various aspects of our health and omega-3 fatty acid deficiency, including in children with ADHD may have lower levels of omega-3 fatty acids and present with a higher need for this nutrient. So how can we get our kids, if they do eat fish, eating more oily fish, if they are uh, obviously not plant-based? Well, a couple of things that I tend to recommend, you could make fish cakes, fish fingers uh, out of oily fish. So things like salmon, ask your fishmonger to cut you strips of fish, take the skin off, and you could just dip this into a little bit of flour, egg, and either ground almonds or some ground breadcrumbs, and just pop that under the grill on an oiled baking tray. Really, really delicious. If your children are not so keen on eating fish, you could try making a fish dip. So you can just blend some cooked fish with some plain yogurt or some cream cheese or mascarpone cheese or with some silken tofu if they are dairy free. And this makes a really, really nice dip. You could add a bit of horseradish, some herbs, some lemon zest, that kind of thing. If they really won't eat fish or you are plant based, do try to include more linseed, uh, chia seeds. And a great way to include these is to gr use ground ones or grind them up yourself. And you can put these into baking, flapjacks, biscuits, that also goes really, really nicely stirred into something like porridge. Another really simple swap to get our children to eat more fiber, which is really important for our gut microbiome and blood sugar balance, is to swap from white to whole grain. So I really do encourage you as parents and carers to try to move towards whole grain rather than refined white carbohydrates. So that's your whole grain breads, it's your whole grain pastas, that kind of thing. But you can do this process gradually, add in a little bit, bit by bit. So slowly swap onto whole grain pasta, slowly swap onto more whole grain bread, find one that they like, uh, and just gradually move over to having more whole grains. I also just want to mention here protein as well. So do make sure, particularly if you're experiencing some challenging behavior, mood swings going up and down, teenagers, mood swings going up and down, do make sure that each meal does include some protein. Protein helps to support really good, healthy blood sugar control, which then can really help to balance our mood and behavior. So trying to include about a fistful of protein with every meal. So that's things like meat, fish, eggs, uh, shellfish, dairy, um, also beans, pulses, quinoa, and you can top up 
uh, protein with nuts and seeds as well. Lucy Kelly does talk about this more in her lecture, uh, in her talk that she has done. I'd like to just focus now on how we think about portion sizes. So I mentioned the portion size is about a fistful and that works generally quite well for children of all ages. So you can think about constructing a meal that you're going to have about a fistful of protein and you match that with about the same in your carbohydrates. So that's your grains or potatoes uh, or oats. And then you want to be getting about half a plate of different colored vegetables or salad or a little bit of fruit and then always add a portion of healthy fats. So that might be the omega fats that I talked about earlier. So some nuts or some seeds, or you might have your protein being oily fish, which counts as fats, or things like avocado or um, uh, extra virgin olive oil also are good sources of healthy fats. So let's just finish off on a few micronutrient deficiencies that we might see in our children. So zinc is a really important mineral. And I often find that, you know, I suspect zinc might be low when I'm working with restrictive or picky eaters because a lack of zinc can very much affect our digestion. It also impacts our appetite and our sense of taste or smell. Um, when you work with an NT, of course, they can help you to find the right zinc supplements and dosage if that is a route that you would like to explore. But you can really work on making sure that your child gets enough zinc in their diet. And this is especially important at puberty because growth requires a lot of zinc and you can start to see that there might be some signs and symptoms of zinc deficiency around this time. Low levels of zinc might be uh, implicated when you're starting to look at hyperactivity, difficulty concentrating, that kind of thing. So foods that contain zinc, nuts and seeds, which you can grind up and add into baking, particularly pumpkin seeds. You could add that to porridge and soups and breads and things like that. Whole grains, dried food, uh, fruit, seafood, fish and red meat are all really, really good sources of zinc. Iron is a common one also to be aware of around this age, particularly for teenage girls. And it's really important for not only our energy production uh, and energy levels, but also for our brain function. Iron plays a critical role in how our body makes the neurotransmitters serotonin, implicated in our mood, and dopamine, which might be implicated in how well we concentrate. People are generally more at risk of an iron deficiency if they have a vegan or plant-based diet that is not well planned. So it's really important if you have a plant-based teenage girl to really be aware of making sure that she's getting in enough iron. So that might be dark green leafy veg, meat, fish, liver, beans, nuts, dried fruit, seeds, lentils, chickpeas, and even dark chocolate is a great source. That's just 70% and above cacao dark chocolate. I'm becoming increasingly more concerned about the potential lack of calcium in teenagers' diets, particularly with the rise of vegan milks. Where there is a poor diet, and unfortunately a lot of teenagers do have a poor diet, milk is a little bit of a superfood because it is one of our great sources of calcium. Um, and it, you know, looking at unprocessed sources of dairy to help provide calcium. But there are also many non-dairy sources of calcium. So these include things like dark green leafy veg, so your broccoli and kale, nuts and seeds again, beans, pulses, hummus, sardines and any fish where you eat the bones like pilchards and fresh parsley, great one to throw onto food or to make pestos with. And don't forget to make sure that your child is getting enough vitamin D, particularly through the winter, to help with that absorption of calcium. Finally, I want to mention magnesium. It's a mighty mineral for our nervous system. And I'm seeing more and more children presenting with um, anxiety and other mental health challenges. And magnesium is a natural muscle relaxant. And a common sign of magnesium deficiency is muscle cramps, twitching, restless legs, that kind of thing. It's also really, really important for keeping our blood sugar levels nice and balanced, and also really important for balanced mood and behavior. So good sources of magnesium include, again, nuts and seeds, 
dark green leafy vegetables, bananas, avocado, fish beans, and also again, dark chocolate or cacao powder. You can also get magnesium to be absorbed well through the skin. So you can add Epsom salts or magnesium flakes into a bath. And I also find it a really good way to get magnesium into teenagers who like to game is to get a washing up bowl with um, uh, warm water in, pop in some magnesium salts or some Epsom salts, and you can get your kids to sit there with their feet in those uh, in those lovely magnesium salts while they are gaming. Obviously, please be careful with any electricity supplies, but you know we can just sit there with our feet in the in the lovely warm magnesium salts while we're carrying on with our homework or our gaming. So I hope you found these tips helpful today to encourage your children to embrace a healthier way of eating. Most of all, what I'd like you to take away from today is to never give up. Wherever your child or your young person is eating, that slight change, that one extra nutritious ingredient absolutely is worth it. Hold the course, be consistent and never give up and just focus on those things that you can add to their food. Just one more, just one more, and make healthy eating the norm as much as you possibly can. If you enjoyed this presentation, then click on the link in the description to subscribe to our Nutrition Talks email list. And don't forget to click the like button and subscribe.